Welcome to today's lesson, which is Special Sequences and Summation Notation. We're just going to practice some of the skills that you learned in the investigation. Our first example asks us to write down the first five terms of the following recursively defined sequence, where s sub 1 equals 1 and s sub n is equal to n times s sub n minus 1. So we'll start by rewriting the first term, s sub 1 equals 1. Now if we follow the formula, s sub 2 has got to equal 2 times s to the 2 minus 1 or 2 times s sub 1, the prior value, which is 2 times 1, which equals 2. s sub 3 is going to be equal to 3 times s sub 3 minus 1 or 2, which is 3 times 2, which is 6. So now I think we know that s sub 4 is going to be 4 times s sub 3, which is 6, which gives us 24, and then s sub 5 is going to be 5 times the prior number, 24, which is equal to 120. Example 2, we're going to try to determine the sequence from a pattern. Now these are a little more challenging because we have to figure out where we can see a 1, a 2, a 3, and a 4. Now the first one's not so bad. We know this is the first term, the second term, third term, the fourth term. Keep in mind that e to the 1 over 1 is equal to e, so we can say that a sub n is equal to e to the n over n. We basically want to find where we see a number that is increasing by 1 and that is something that we'll be able to replace with n. So let's look at part b. 1, 1 third, 1 ninth, 1 twenty seventh. Uh, there's a few ways you can look at this. You could either say I see that the denominator is being multiplied by 3 or you could say that I see that each term is being multiplied by 1 third. Another way we could look at this is we could say that 3 is 3 to the 1, 9 is 3 squared, and 27 is 3 cubed. Now we're seeing our 1, 2, 3. So keep in mind that 1 is the same as 3 to the 0. So I'm going to say a sub n is equal to 1 over 3 to the n. And then I'm going to see if that works. If this was true, a sub 1 would be equal to 1 third. Well, I need a sub 1 to be equal to 1 over 3 to the 0. So that means I need it to not be 1 over 3 to the n, but 1 over 3 to the n minus 1. Now, if I were to find a sub 1, that would be 1 over 3 to the 1 minus 1, or 1 over 3 to the 0, or 1. Another way we can look at this, though, is we could also say that this is equal to 1 third raised to the n minus 1. And both of these solutions would be correct. Part C, 1, 3, 5, 7. Here you can see that we're adding 2 to get from one term to the next. So anytime you're adding something, you should see that something times n in your formula. So I'm going to just start and say a sub n is equal to 2 times n. So now if I were to do that, when n is equal to 1, my answer would be 2. That's not right. So how about we say 2n minus 1. So now when n is equal to 1, I'm going to get 2 times 1, which is 2 minus 1, which is 1. When n is equal to 2, I'm going to get 4 minus 1, which is equal to 3. So that actually worked, and that is one way that we could do our solution. You might recognize, though, that this is an arithmetic sequence, so we also could see that a sub n is equal to our first term plus our common difference 2 times n minus 1. If we simplify this, though, we get 1 plus 2n minus 2, which is equal to 2n minus 1, which is what we figured out from the very beginning. Our next pattern, we have 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 
and you might recognize these as all perfect squares. So this is 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, and 5 squared. So if we see this, we see our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is our base, so we can say that a sub n is equal to n squared. Now that's not that bad when you can clearly see that they are perfect squares, but what if I simply added 1 to each of these and instead we had the sequence 2, 5, 10, 17, and 26. Now it's not as obvious that this is actually a sub n is equal to n squared plus 1. So what do you do? Well, I look at this and I go, how do I get from 1 to 4? That's plus 3. From 4 to 9 is plus 5. 9 to 16 is plus 7. And 16 to 25 is plus 9. Now when we look at the second sequence, n squared plus 1, 2 to 5 is plus 3. 5 to 10 is plus 5. 10 to 17 is plus 7. And 17 to 26 is plus 9. Notice that the number that I'm adding increases by 2 each time. If you see a sequence where the number that is added increases by 2 each time, look for perfect squares. So here I would say, wow, the nearest perfect square to 2 is 1, the nearest perfect square to 5 is 4, 9, 16, and 25, and the difference between these is just a plus 1. Part E, we have 1, negative 1 half, 1 third, negative 1 fourth, 1 fifth. On the surface, this is fairly simple because we can say that a sub n is equal to 1 over n. Our first term, when n is 1, is 1 over 1, which is 1. Our second term, a sub 2, would be 1 half, and so on. The catch is, is that we are alternating negative numbers each time. So the way we handle that, is we multiply by negative 1 to the n. Because negative 1 raised to an odd exponent will give you a negative number, and negative 1 raised to an even will give you a positive. So as n changes from even to odd, even to odd, our terms are going to change from positive to negative, positive to negative. Now after I do this, I better go back and look and make sure this is going to work. When n is equal to 1, I get a sub 1 is 1 over 1 times negative 1 to the 1, which gives me negative 1. Well, I'm supposed to get positive 1. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm either going to have to add 1 or subtract 1 to n in my formula. So I'm going to subtract 1. I'm going to recalculate my a sub 1. And now I'm going to get 1 over 1 times negative 1 to the 1 minus 1, which is negative 1 to the 0, which is positive 1. a sub 2 is going to be 1 half times negative 1 to the 2 minus 1, which will give me negative 1 half. And now I've been successful. The next thing we're going to talk about is the factorial symbol, which is n with an exclamation mark. And what the factorial symbol really means is, you can see it right here, n times n minus 1, where you keep subtracting 1 from each factor until you reach 1. So for example, 0 factorial is 1, 1 factorial is also 1, 2 factorial is 2 times 1, which is equal to 2, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to 6, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to 24. And notice that with each term, to get from 1 to 2, we multiply by 2, we multiply by 3, we multiply by 4. So when the multiplier increases by 1, this is going to be a factorial. So that means then that 5 factorial is actually equal to 5 times 4 factorial, or 120. They've summarized that in this formula. The n factorial is always equal to n times n minus 1 factorial. It's a good idea for you to familiarize yourself with the sequence 1, 2, 6, 24, 
120. The next thing we're going to look at is summation notation. And this is when we symbolically represent a series of numbers that are being added up. And we use this Greek letter sigma to donate the sum. So this is actually a capital S for sum in Greek. When we see sigma notation, we always have some kind of an expression or a formula that's going to be a function of some variable. In this case, it's usually k. And then we have to say, well, what's the starting value for k? I put k is equal to 1. It doesn't have to start at 1. And then we put some ending value for k. And the way we say this is the sum of a sub k from k equals 1 to k equals n. So let's practice writing out a sum. Part a the sum of 1 over k as k equals 1 to 10. So this is going to be the same as me saying this is 1 over 1. I'll substitute in a 1 for k. Then I'm going to add that to 1 over when k is equal to 2. Now I have to increase k by 1 each time, plus 1 third, plus 1 fourth, plus 1 fifth, plus 1 sixth, plus 1 seventh, plus 1 eighth, plus 1 ninth, plus one tenth. Now typically then you would add these together and get a number, but they didn't ask us to evaluate this, they just asked us to write out the sum. Part B is a little different because instead of having an ending value for k, we just have a generic variable n. So the way we would do this, we, we would say that, okay, I'm going to start at 1, so I'm going to have 1 factorial plus 2 factorial plus 3 factorial. Now I can't just keep writing an infinite number of terms. So after I've written out 3 to show the pattern, I'll just do a plus dot 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 and then I'll show the last term and the last term has to be n factorial. Example 4, express each sum using summation notation. Now this is where we're going to practice some of the skills that we did in example two. We're going to see if we can find the pattern and write it as summation notation. Now for part A, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus dot 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 9 squared is actually not too bad because once we see the 1 and the 2 and the 3, we know that that's got to be our k. So here is our sigma. I'm going to say that this formula is k squared, k We'll start at 1, and because the last term, the base is 9, k is going to end at 9. Part B, we have 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth, and so on. So you might notice that we are multiplying the denominator by 2, or you could also notice that we're multiplying the whole term by 1 half to get from 1 to the next. So whenever we see a constant multiplier, we should see that multiplier raised to the n in our formula. So I am going to write this as the sum of 1 half raised to the k when k is equal to 1 and ends at n minus 1. So now that I've written my formula, I have to look and see does it work. So when I plug in a 1 for k, my first term should be 1 half, but when I look back at my list, my first term is supposed to be equal to 1. I'm only going to get 1 if I raise 1 half to the 0. So there's two ways I can handle that. The easiest thing would be to replace this with k minus 1. Now when k is equal to 1, I'm going to have 1 half to the 0. When k is equal to 2, I'm going to have 1 half to the 1 which is equal to 1 half. But now this doesn't work for when I plug in my last term which is n minus 1 because that would give me 1 half to the n minus 2 as my final answer. So I've got two ways I can fix this. One way is I can get rid of the n minus 1 at the top and have this end at n. So when I plug in an n at the end I have 1 half to the n minus 1. But another way I can do this is I could say I have the sum of 1 half to the k. I can keep this as n minus 1, and instead of starting with k equal to 1, I could start with k is equal to 0. So 1 half to the 0 gives me my 1, and 1 half to the n minus 1 gives me my last term. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.